Um, thank you. Let me start uh, um, thanking uh, very much your, the organizers for this uh, invitation. It's an honor for me to speak uh, here in Pisa. Uh, in fact, I have quite a strong and continued connection with, with Pisa and the group here. Um, I did my, my PhD with Louis Nirenberg in uh, New York and uh, then I spent one year in Princeton, but my first, uh, the second postdoc, first postdoc in Europe, we was in Paris 6 with Brazis, but included uh, three months, uh, to stay three months in the beginning. So right away uh, when coming from, from the US in Pisa, and that was uh, the fall of 95, and uh, it was my first time in Pisa. I had the pleasure to meet uh, the Georgi then. In fact, my office was very close to, to his. Uh, but unfortunately, I did not talk mathematics uh, to him. Um, but uh, from, that po from that moment, I came back to Pisa very often for shorter or longer periods. And in particular, I collaborated and I had many discussions with, uh, with the group, the so, so strong group here in our field, as Felix said, and uh, more particularly with Luigi Ambrosio, with Giovanni Alberti, many discussions also with Carlo Mantegazza, and they influenced very much my, my work. Um, it was a little later, so maybe 98, that I started working in a problem uh, raised by the Georgi, and uh, that is this conjecture of the Georgi on the Allen Kahn equation. And uh, of course, that started, that started from uh, the last paper written by Henri Berestiki, uh, Luis Caffarelli, and uh, Louis Nirenberg in the Annali in the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, where, uh, as I will mention later, they studied some properties of elliptic equations that that made, made them see that, 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 that we're leading towards on having a strong connection with the conjecture of the Georgi. And in fact, that work of them, of the three of them, uh, um, was, the, was the source of inspiration for the first results in the, in the, in the, regarding this conjecture of the Georgi. The conjecture was Set was uh, raised by the Georgian in 78 or 79 and uh, written down at least. And the first result was 90, 98 or 99, so 20 years later. And I will talk about this. So the plan of the talk and, the, and the, the purpose of the talk is maybe twofold. First, to tell you the state of the art to, uh, regarding this conjecture and state three open problems that I consider uh, the most important ones, uh, because not everything is solved yet, as you will see. And especially, I think that the most important, or one of them, uh, co is connected with this, uh, regards, regards this uh, solution that you see here in the title, the saddle shape solution to the Allen Carr equation. So the second part of the talk I will describe in detail, which is, uh, this sol what is this solution? and the properties that, uh, that we know. There is not so much about it. In fact, I will be speaking about on a paper of me uh, from four years ago, 2012. So it's an old work, but I find appropriate uh, for the meeting and for the memory of the Georgie to speak about this first. And second, this work that I have uh, published a uh, journal, Mathematique Pure Appliqué, 2012, on the saddle shape solution. I think there are some open questions that I will mention that still were not, uh, no progress was made. They are not so easy perhaps, but there are some more affordable. And I urge, or I like young people <laughs> to try to, to make a, to make a, a progress uh, on that. I think some things are possible. And still, since I published the paper, there are no real advance uh, progress on that, okay? So that's the, like, the plan. And now let's go into, into matter. Um, okay. Sorry about that. 
Okay, the first slides are about minimal surfaces. So uh, they already appeared in several talks, for instance, in uh, Fleming's uh, slides yesterday. So you already know this, but let's just review it a little fast. Uh, this is a very uh, strong and difficult to prove theorem, maybe the most important one in the theory of minimal surfaces, I think, or one of them. It's uh, mainly uh, the proof is by Simons, 68, and it says that if you have a set of mi minimal perimeter in a range, so the boundary of E is a surface without boundary, that it's a minimal surface which minimizes, minimizing, so I would say minimizing minimal surface, okay? Then if uh, it's included in a range, it's a six-dimensional object, the, the boundary, uh, at most, six-dimensional, if n is less or equal than seven, uh, then it must be a hyperplane, okay? And the main point uh, in this theorem, what Simon's proof is that if you have a cone, which is uh, minimizing, um, then uh, with singularity at the origin only, uh, then if it's in a ren and n is less or equal than seven, uh, it must be a hyperplane. So that's the key point, and that's a difficult proof, okay? Um, then you wonder if seven is the best dimension, and in fact it is, and to explain this, let's go to, for instance, R8, or an even dimension, R2M, and consider this cone that already appeared also. It's called the Simon's cone. You take the first n variables, and you look at the radial variable given by them, and you look at the radial variable given by the, the, the last n variables, and S equals T, it's like this diagonal here on the ST plane. Um, by symmetry, it's very easy to see that it has zero mean curvature always in dimension two, four, six, eight, ten, all dimensions. Then you wonder when uh, is it a minimizing minimal surface or minimal cone? And in these dimensions, it's not going to be. In two, four, six, it's not going to be by the theorem. And then this is the first contribution by De Giorgi, together with Bombieri and, uh, and Enrico Giusti. One year after, they proved that uh, in dimension eight and higher, even dimension eight and higher, the Simon's cone is a minimizing minimal cone, okay? This result, I will tell you about the proof of this. Now, by now, this is very easy to prove, in fact. And I will come back to, to, to that, okay? This is for... Uh, boundaries of sets, of general sets, and the first one which is uh, minimizing is, uh, is in dimension eight, so the, the boundary has dimension seven, is a surface of dimension seven, okay? Now let's go to graphs. Imagine that I want the boundary of this set not to turn but to be a graph. Then, uh, then you have to go one more dimension up to have a minimizer. Uh, not, it will not have dimension seven, like this guy, but dimension eight, when you go to graphs. So these next slides, the, um, the, 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 the result of, this is not only due to Simons, as we learned yesterday in Fleming's uh, slides, it's also due to a reduction argument of the Georgi, and maybe Algram is also involved here. It says, but mainly it's a corollary of the previous theorem, mainly. Um, it says, if now uh, the surface is a graph over the whole space, and this means that you have a function that solves this equation, and being a graph, automatically it's minimizing all graphs that have zero mean curvature, which is this equation, are automatically minimizing. Uh, if the dimension, sorry, if the dimension is less or equal than uh, seven, which means that the surface is seven-dimensional at, at, at most, then uh, it is a plane. The graph is a plane, a hyperplane, okay? And also in the same paper, Bombieri de Giorgi Giusti proved that this is optimal because if you are in R8, there is a function of two variables. In fact, it only depends on the S and T variables. Remember S, T from the previous uh, slide there is a function which is zero on the Simon's cone, positive here, negative here, odd with respect, it's odd with respect to the cone. Uh, the level sets look like that, are asymptotic, 
to the cone at infinity and uh, solves this equation in R8. So the graph of this function that grows in a polynomial way to infinity and to minus infinity, the graph of this function is an eight-dimensional uh, surface which uh, is a graph and it's a minimal graph, okay? So it's minimizing, right? So these are the, the theorems. And then uh, I think uh, it was mainly the Georgie and his school who discovered a, conne a connection between the allen kahn equation for phase transitions and minimal surfaces. So this is mainly the modica mortola theorem. I will go very fast because I think most of you know this. And um, it just says that this is the allen kahn equation, okay? Uh, this is the nonlinearity. It's a bistable nonlinearity. And suppose you have a solution in all Rn, and the so these solutions are going to live between minus 1 and 1. So u takes values between minus 1 and 1, okay? And what you do is you look at, imagine the level sets of the function there on the wall, level sets, and I start looking at them from farther and farther and farther. So I walk away and I look at the level sets, not close by, but farther and farther. This is called, this is called uh, I'm doing a blowdown, a blowdown of the solution, which is this. So I see less, less, less details the level sets get compressed when I go away, and the theorem of gamma, it's a, in the gamma convergence, gamma convergence uh, sense, the theorem of Modica Mortola says that the uh, allen kahn functional gamma converges to the perimeter functional. This means, for instance, that minimizers, maybe you have some boundary conditions, maybe not, let's not worry about this, let's start with a global solution, minimizers, of this equation, I should tell you what are minimizers of this equation, that's important, will converge to characteristic functions, the characteristic function of a set, and this set will be uh, of minimal perimeter, okay? So at the end, it's like uh, there are two species, the species minus one, one, they separate, they don't like each other because the reaction becomes very strong, they don't like each other, diffusion is very small compared to reaction, they separate, and the nice thing is that they separate, they don't like some, they don't like at all, they separate in such a way that the interface between them has the least possible area, so less possible contact in area between the two species, okay? So you have to understand uh, like this. So what does it mean minimizer here or in the minimal surface? for uh, those who are not experts on this, because a hyperplane has infinite area. So what does it mean to be minimizer? It means minimizer in uh, the following sense, locally in space. You take your surface, it has infinite area, probably. You perturb it in a compact set, say in a ball. You perturb it only there. Any perturbation, small or big, so we are speaking about absolute minimizers. You perturb it there, you don't touch it outside of the ball. And then you compare the areas in this small ball, in this ball, fixed ball, okay? But small or large, but fixed. And that's the meaning of a minimizer. And the same for the allen kahn equation. Uh, solutions, non-trivial solutions of this equation have infinite energy in R2, in R3, in any dimension larger or equal than two, infinite energy, but I will say that uh, the solution U is a local minimizer in the terminology of the Georgie or a global minimizer, global because it's a global solution in all space, both terminologies are used. If for every ball, if I change U only in this ball uh, with the same boundary values on the boundary of the ball as U, if I change it, then the energy, the allen kahn energy increases. Of course, the allen kahn energy is is the Dirichlet energy, one half grad u square, plus a potential energy that is a double well, a double well potential with minima at minus one and one, okay? And the proof of Modica Mortola, it's a very nice one, it's based, the, the, the difficult part, which is the lower bound, is based on writing the energy in this way and making simply a Cauchy's words, <laughs> Cauchy's words here, which is quite, close to equality in many cases, in the good cases, at least asymptotically. And then once you are here, you see this is the gradient of a new profile of you. 
and this profile will go to a characteristic and when you have the gradient of a characteristic this is the perimeter of the set the the area of the boundary okay so this is pretty much the the idea of the proof and this is the uh, these are the results I want to the very strong results the main results in in the in this uh, in this business of the conjecture of the Georgian the Allen Kahn. This is the first. It's a perfect result, like in minimal surface theory. No extra hypothesis, no nothing. It's perfect. It says, and this is a paper of Ovidiu Sabin in the Annals of Math. He discovered this when I was in Austin, 2003. This is his PhD thesis with uh, Luis Caffarelli. It appeared in, uh, in the Annals in 2009. It says, oh, here is the energy, here is the double well potential. If you have a local or a global, it's the same. Global minimizer of the equation of the functional in all of our n, if n is less or equal than seven, then the level sets of u are hyperplanes. The level sets of u are hyperplanes, parallel hyperplanes. The function u depends only on one Euclidean variable. We say that the solution is 1D. It's a solution that depends on one Euclidean variable, solves the OD. Okay, and it's a transition that goes from minus one to one like this. The level sets are, by the way, are of dimension six at most. Okay, in R7 would be of dimension six, exactly like in the theorem of Simons. Then you wonder, is this seven correct? And this is still not known. Okay, uh, this is the theorem uh, that we have, that is also a perfect theorem in a sense, um, quite perfect, say. It's also published in the Annals of Math. It's a paper by Manuel Del Pino, Kowalczyk, and Jung Chen Wei. It says if you have a global minimizer, sorry, in, uh, in dimension nine, there exists a global minimizer which is not a 1D function. The level sets are not hyperplanes. In addition, it's monotone increasing on the, on the last variable, and its level sets when you see them from far away, from far away, they look like the Bombieri, the Giorgi, Giusti minimal graph that I presented before. So, so you see the level sets are uh, eight dimensional surfaces, graphs, by the way, because of this, because of this monotonicity, the level sets are graphs. And uh, in the construction, they prove and they use the Bombieri, the Giorgi, just the minimal graph, okay? So, um, but here there is a seven and here there is a nine. So what happens in dimension eight is still not known. So this is the main open problem in my opinion, in this theory, what happens in dimension eight. And as you will see, we have a candidate, a canonical, good candidate for uh, a solution that exists in dimension eight. It's not monotone in any direction. It's going to be called the saddle shape solution. I will present it in a second. And the question is, is it a minimizer in dimension eight? And more questions that will come later, but this would be the main one, okay? So let's present the saddle shape solution. It's not difficult. I'm in, dim in even dimension. 2m, take the first m variables, and this is the radial variable s, t is the other ones. This is the Simon's cone. And as the Bombieri, the Georgi Giusti graph, it's going, u is going to depend only on s and t. Okay, it's a function of eight variables, say, or 10 variables, say eight, but it depends only on s and t. So it has these symmetries. It's odd with respect to the Simon's cone, <coughs> It's positive here, it's negative there, and solves the equation. And this is the concept of saddle shaped solution. So, because there, later there will be a unique theorem. So, a saddle shaped solu solution is a solution that depends on S and T. It's odd with respect to the Simon's cone. In particular, it vanishes because it's odd, vanishes on the Simon's cone, and solves the equation. That's it. And look at the equation now written in ST variables. It's a very nice one. So in my paper, you will see later, we will work with this equation. And for me, this was a novelty. I didn't see works on this 
ra w radial PDE, say, and I would like to see more works on it, okay? So um, the questions will come later. So what is known? The existence is very easy. You build existence in compact sets, and you, you let, uh, you let, you, you, you build uh, solutions uh, of saddle shape type in compact sets with some boundary conditions, and you let the radius of these balls go to infinity. You have compactness, they converge to something. It's easy, very easy to prove that in every, even in R2, R4, R6, there exists a saddle shape solution or saddle solution, but the right way seria, sad, would be saddle shaped, to call it saddle shaped, because the level sets look like saddle, sh saddles, right? Um, it always exists. Then I proved with my student, Joanna Terra, two papers, that it is unstable. By the way, it's not a minimizer in R2, R4, and R6 by the theorem of Sabine, okay? It's not a minimizer. But Sabine's theorem is a very strong and difficult theorem. So in these papers, we prove even more, it's not a minimizer, but even more, it's not stable, okay? It's not stable. I will say what is stable in a second. In dimensions two, four, and six, and the proof is quite simple. We will see the proof later. Let's forget about this because some people tell me that maybe this paper is, there is a gap, okay? But I think it should be true that in dimension one, it has Morse index one, and in dimension four and six, this is true, we prove that it has infinite Morse index. For those of you who know what is Morse index, but let's not uh, waste time on this now. Okay, and then this is my paper uh, in Journal Mathematique Pure Appliqué, 2012, where I prove first a theorem I like pretty much, and um, at the end it's not so difficult, but uh, it was not clear to me. The saddle shape solution is unique. There is a unique solution with the properties, with the properties there, okay? In every dimension, even dimension. And then all what is known about stability and instability, I still have to tell you what means stable. All what is known is this, that the saddle shape solution is stable in R14, R16, R18, R2M when 2M is greater or equal than 14, okay, 14. So the open problem here, and this is more doable, I think. So, so I, 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 I think this is a nice problem to think by, by everybody, but in particular strong young people who have new ideas. We don't know if the saddle shape solution is stable in dimension eight, 10, and 12. And stability is a simpler thing to prove as you will see later, than minimality. Of course, the big problem is to prove that the saddle shape solution is a minimizer in R8. It's not known if the saddle shape solution is a minimizer in any dimension. I would, would be nice to see somebody proving that the saddle shape solution is a minimizer in R2M if M is very large, <laughs> a million, okay, for instance. This we don't know how to do neither, all right? So what is stability? Stability, you can imagine. It's simply that the second variation of, of, of energy is positive definite or non-negative definite for perturbations with compact support, okay? So it means simply that, um, that the linearized operator minus Laplace minus F prime of U zero order term, the linearized operator is coercive or satisfies the maximum principle, say, in bounded sets, or has in every ball has first Dirichlet eigenvalue greater or equal than zero, okay? All right, so this is the stability. So open prime one, is the saddle shape solution a minimizer in R8 or at least in higher dimensions? Much more doable, I think. Is it stable in, dim it's stable in dimensions 8, 10, or 12? This is, for me, the main open problem. What is known are only two results. Nothing of this is known, but there are two results towards giving some partial answer. 
The first one is Packard, uh, from Packard and Junction Way. And now a very recent one, not yet published, you will find it in archive by Young Liu, Kelly Wang, and also Junction Way. And it says, very fast, they say, they say the paper says, in R8, there is a stable solution. And now we know that even a global minimizer, which is not 1D, good. But we don't know if it, this minimizer is the, or they don't know if this minimizer is the saddle shape solution or not. Okay? So how is this minimizer? It is built through the gluing method or approximate solutions or Lyapunov-Schmidt method developed by Packard mainly and collaborators and Junction Wei, Del Pino. And it says, uh, it proves in R8 uh, or R2M, 2M greater or equal than 8, there exists a family of solutions for a param parameterized by lambda when lambda is large enough, less than one, converging to one as lambda go to infinity. So these solutions are connected to the function one, the trivial solution one, that depend only on the ST variables and the level sets, or say the zero level set, is not a hyperplane, good, and converge at infinity to the Simon's cone. And in addition, this solution is stable. That was proved three years ago. And now they also proved that it's a global minimizer. So the zero level set of these solutions look like that. The first one has this zero level set. Next ones have this zero level set, that this zero level set, and this family of uh, hyperbolas, more or less type of hyperbola, go to infinity, the solution goes to one. But what is not known is that if you can go down with these level sets and connect this family with the one that vanishes on the Simon's cone, that is the saddle shape solution, okay? So this is what remains to be done. But this is all what is known. Let me now speak one second about the original conjecture of the Georgi, because the original conjecture of the Georgi is also, unfortunately, mostly open, say, in a way, the way he wrote the conjecture. But this, I believe, is a very, very, very tough open problem, and nobody, I think, has an idea about this. So what, how the Georgi stated the conjecture on purpose or not on purpose, this we don't know, nobody knows, right? <laughs> not even Luigi. <laughs> is this way. Um, take a solution of Allen Kahn, which is strictly increasing in one variable, the last variable. Then, if n is less or equal than 8, the level sets are hyperplanes. So the function is 1D. Look, by this condition, the level sets are graphs. Maybe not global graphs. This is very difficult. This is not known. And this would be a very big progress towards the conjecture, in fact. Global graphs means graphs of xn as a function of x prime, and x prime defined in all rn minus 1. This is not known. But they will be graphs. And that when looked at infini from infinity uh, should be minimal graphs. So, so now, you see, you now, now you see from the minimal surface theory why this eight, okay? And this eight should be sharp. This is known to be true only in dimensions two and three. And these are the first papers, 10 years after the conjecture, 20 years after the conjecture, motivated by this work I told you in the beginning by Henri Berestiki, Luis Caffarelli, and Louis Nirenberg. Um, there you will find very nice uh, questions and some answers about Schrodinger operators, so Laplace plus a potential in all space. And that motivated strongly uh, Nassif Gosup and Chan uh, for the proof of the conjecture in dimension two. Then I came back to Pisa after my first visit was in 95, came back probably in 98 to give a PhD course invited by Mariano Giaquinta at the Departimento and I started working on this problem, motivated by this paper, but coming here, I started talking to, to it 
mainly with Luigi, and we could prove it in dimension, uh, in dimension three in this way, pretty much. So, and this is a very difficult open problem, I think, uh, what happens in dimension four to eight is still open. But there is a very important work, which is the one of, of, of Ovidiu, Sabine, that says, remember, the theorem of Ovidiu says this, this is the good, th the nice theorem of Ovidiu because there is no extra assumption, no superfluous assumption. You just have a global minimizer. If you are in Rn, n less or equal than seven, it's 1D. Okay, so this is a round theorem, like in minimal surface theory. A corollary of it, immediate corollary from work that I will mention later by Giovanni Alberti, Luigi Ambrosio, and myself, is that if you add one more hypothesis that the solution in the last variable tends to plus minus one at plus minus infinity, then automatically by, our, by my work with, with Giovanni and Luigi, this and the monotonicity implies that you is a minimizer and I will prove this for you later. And therefore, by the theorem of Ovidio, if n is less or equal than seven, it's 1D. But by the reduction of the Georgi, when you have monotone solutions, which means level sets being graphs, you can go always one more dimension, and then the eight is okay. So the Georgi was correct, but still we need this extra assumption, okay? So this is open prime two. And now there is a very other important, for me, very important open problem and for also for the people in geometry in particular, Antonio Ross uh, from Granada, who is an expert in minimal surfaces, always insisted to me on this open problem, which is the following. In minimal surface, I'm not an expert, but I learned <laughs> that there is still a very big open problem regarding the first transparency, which is, what if I replace minimality by stability? Let's take a surface, the boundary of a set in Rn that is, has zero mean curvature, it's a minimal surface, it's stationary, and it is stable, which means pretty much that for small perturbations with compact support, small perturbations, the area increases. Okay, is it a plane? Well, in, the, in R2, yes. In R3, this is a celebrated theorem by uh, Sean and by Do Carmo, independently, I think. And quite re the 80s, maybe, or 90s? 80s. So in R3 is known. Every stable, minimal surface is a hyperplane. And I think they believe, uh, the experts believe that this could be true, should be true up to dimension, uh, up to dimension seven, <laughs> okay? But this is unknown already in R4, okay? Uh, so, uh, okay, so what is the, op you can ask now the same problem for Alan Kahn. And uh, this is, uh, there are, no results on this direction, so now you know what is open problem three. Take a stable solution of Allen Kahn in R3, try to prove that it's 1D. <laughs> okay, the level sets I have are hyperplanes. And uh, the only thing you need to prove is an energy estimate. The energy estimate that was first proved by me and Luigi in dimension three, using monotonicity of the solution. Here you don't have monotonicity of the solution, neither minimality, because then the energy estimate is for free. <laughs> you have stability only. So you just need to prove the energy estimate that says that energy in a ball of radius R is bounded by a constant times R square, or R to the N minus one, three minus one, two. That's all what you need to prove. That is not known, and there is only one result in this direction, very recent result for the fractional Laplacian in R3. Uh, and this is um, a work of me with, uh, we are writing up with a very strong uh, student that uh, I had that finished the thesis two years ago, 
uh, Joaquim Serra, super strong. He's um, making publicity, but I think I have the right. Uh, he's going to start, now. he worked with Enrico Valdinoci in Berlin for a year, and now he starts with Alessio Figali in the ETH. Joaquim Serra and Eleonora Cinti, who was also a student of me. Myself, we can prove this for minus Laplace and S, S, less, uh, S, um, greater um, uh, than one half. S less than one half, sorry, <laughs> because for other things, S less than one half, I think. Um, it's quite very recent. Okay, so let me tell you a little about the proofs. I said that the Simon's cone is minimizing in a rate. Now it's very simple to prove. This was first proved by Bombieri de Giorgi Giusti. Now it's very simple, and this was proved in a very simple way in two papers by students, I think, of Luigi. First, um, um, Davini, right? Who was not student of you? Paulini first, sorry. Paulini. And then Guido de Filippis and... Yeah, no, but first there is a paper by Davini. Was not a student of you, I guess. No. <laughs> first there was a paper by Davini, which is very simple already. And then the Filippis and Paulini. Uh, improving a little and simplifying a little more the paper by Davini. And it's just, um, it just an ODE plus a foliation or calibration argument. So let me do it for you pretty much, not in the strongest way. Let's take the Simon's cone in R8 and let's take S and T. And suppose that I can find, and that's what you do, through an ODE, through an ODE, suppose that you can find a blue la curve here, which is just one, which is a subsolution of the mean curvature equation. So it has mean curvature uh, positive or negative, whatever, <laughs> it depends on the sign, but it's a subsolution. Then rescale it just by homotesy. It's going to be also a subsolution, and you will get these other guys. And uh, since it's a graph, they will not touch each other. They will be disjoint, so they form a foliation. Then once you have these, I claim, then automatically this proves that the red, and then you have the same through the other side just by reflection. Then I claim automatically you can prove that the red guy, the Simon's cone, is a minimizer, an absolute minimizer, a global mi minimizer. How? Well, to do it in the, in the finest way, you have to build a calibration from the foliation. People in Pisa, all people from Pisa knows this. <laughs> but okay, not everybody else knows this. So let's do it in another way. Suppose that I have a little more, and suppose that I have an existence theorem that says in every compact set and for every boundary condition, I know that there is a minimizer of my equation, Allen Kahn or minimal surfaces, whatever. Suppose that I have that from lower semi-continuity and compactness. Then the proof is done. The proof is done like this. Uh, let's take a ball and let's try to prove that with the boundary conditions of the cone, of the Simon's cone, the Simon's cone is the absolute minimizer. What are the boundary conditions of the Simon cone? one here and minus one here on the rest of the ball. Or if you want a curve that starts from here. The minimizer in the plane in R2 is a line to go from here to here, down there, the reflection. In the plane, you go with a straight line. It has the least, least uh, length. You don't go through the origin. But in dimension A, there is this foliation, and, the, and now I will prove for you that you go through the origin, the cheapest way. Why? Suppose that the minimizer is not the red guy, and it's this dotted guy. It's go, imagine always the reflection, OK? It could go up the cone. The argument would be the same. Let's suppose that at some point it goes down. 
and here it arrives with vertical derivative. And now take the leaves of the foliation, starting with a very large, very one, one here very far away, so that doesn't touch this compact thing, which is the minimizer, the dotted thing. That one doesn't touch, next one doesn't touch, next one doesn't touch, next one doesn't touch. There is a first one that touches. And the key point is that because of foliating, it doesn't touch on the boundary. It touches at an interior point. And because this is Neumann, you don't have to worry down here or do reflection. And this is a contradiction because you have a minimal surface, which is the dotted blue, and a sub-minimal surface <laughs> touching at a, an interior point. The maximum principle, the strong maximum principle tells you this is impossible, they have to coincide. So this is the proof, okay? And this idea goes back to Weierstrass, right? And Cara Theodori. And let me tell you an anecdote if you want. <laughs> that says something bad about me and about Luigi and about everybody, but okay. <laughs> um, but says something very good about Giovanni because he discovered. <laughs> um, let me go back to another thing, what I told you. I told you that the second theorem of Sabine was a consequence of the first, which meant if you have a monotone solution, the red one in Rn, monotone with limits one and minus one, then it's a minimizer. Let me prove it for you. Same proof. Take the solution, sorry. Take the solution, slide it in the direction xn in which it's monotone. Slide it up and down. And the graph of the function is going to produce a foliation. Because of monotonicity, these graphs don't touch each other and they foliate. Because of the limits, the assumption in Sabine theorem, they fill minus one cross one. Uh, minus one one cross Rn. Now, let's prove that the red guy is a minimizer. Yes, you know the proof now. Take a ball, give the boundary conditions of the red guy. There is an up minimizer, that's for sure. Between minus one and one, doesn't touch one, doesn't touch minus one. Bring these leaves, the one very far away doesn't touch the minimizer here, bring it, and there will be one that touches first. Not on the boundary, because on the boundary, the minimizer, the dotted thing, which is not drawn here, is equal to the red, and these leaves are larger on the boundary, so it will touch at an interior point contradiction. The minimizer has to coincide with the red, the red is a minimizer, okay? So, when I came to Pisa, when I started working on the conjecture of the Georgi, surprisingly, well, it says bad about us, but it says also bad about Luis Caffarelli <laughs> or, <laughs> or even other people. Um, we didn't know that a monotone solution with limits was a minimizer. Okay. <laughs> And maybe the Georgie knew, maybe not, probably yes, <laughs> but he didn't say it, or if he said it, somebody, uh, everybody forgot. So it took us, uh, so my first work with Luigi, the key point was to prove, in R3, was to prove the energy estimate for monotone solutions with limits. At the end, we don't need the limits in dimension three, without knowing, having monotonicity, but not having. Um, not knowing that it's a minimizer. And we found a beautiful proof through sliding, but uh, not this proof, okay? Using monotonicity. And then some years later, Giovanni came to help us and uh, he discovered that a monotone solution with limits is going to be a minimizer, okay? And you will find a proof in my paper with the two of them with calibrations, but it's not as simple as the one I, I told you because you have to build up the calibration. It's kind of a little messy, okay? It's a little messy, but you, you can find it there. And then some years later, I was speaking about this in Buenos Aires, and you can imagine if I was in Buenos Aires, who was there? <laughs> uh, Luis Caffarelli was there. I explained the proof, our proof with calibrations, 
And then after the talk, Luis came and told me, uh, listen, uh, Javier, I think uh, you can also do it in another way. <laughs> um, slide the red guy, as you do, because in the calibration you also slide it. Slide the red guy, and then prove something even stronger than minimality. Stronger. Prove that in compact sets, with the boundary condition of the red guy, there is uniqueness of solution. So when you solve Allen Kahn with some boundary condition, you don't have uniqueness in general. You don't expect uniqueness. There is no theorem like that. The only one I know is that if you solve the Dirichlet problem with boundary in a ball, with boundary conditions given by the red guy, you are going to have a unique solution of the Dirichlet problem. Why? This proof, the proof that I just told you. Suppose that there is another solution, bring the leaves, they touch at an interior point, contradiction. So this at the end was told to me by Caffarelli some years after, maybe years after, 2003, 2003 I don't remember. And, and then, uh, well, then I discovered that Weyer Strauss knew this, right? And Caratelori is in his book, in his papers, right? Giovanni? The field theory is, what is pretty much <laughs> the foliation, okay? The foliation. All right, anyway, uh, you see here a saddle, not saddle shape, but the mountain pass solution usually are not minimizers, are, are, are Morse index one. If you slide a ground state, or a mountain pass, if you slide it, you don't produce a foliation. In fact, it cuts once. It cuts once. And this is why ground states have Morse index one, in fact. <laughs> like in the sturm liouville theory in the line that you teach to your students. And what happens with the Simon's cone is that in dimension two is a little special and there is only one crossing and that's why the saddle shape solution should, of Allen Kahn should have Morse index one. That's the result of, my, uh, of Michel Schatzman. But still the proof relies on computers and there are some things that should be checked better. Um, and instead in dimension four and six, this is a shooting problem. You shoot, you shoot the ODE of minimal surface starting from this point with, the, with a vertical derivative. You shoot and you look at what you get. And what you get in dimensions four and six is a curve that intersects the Simon's cone infinitely many times. That's why this cone has Morse index infinity, okay? Uh, all right, so that's, that's, that's all. And in the time uh, I'm left, which is not too much, unfortunately, but I'll go a little fast, I want to give you a flavor of the proofs in my paper on the saddle shape solution. So I think I don't have to remember. The, this slide already appeared. We have this PDE, right? We have the Simon's cone. We have a solution which is positive here, odd with respect to the cone. And solve this PDE. S equals zero, T equals zero, don't worry. S equals zero, T equals zero is not even a boundary of this quarter plane because this quarter plane is in R8. And S equals zero is something of co-dimension four. <laughs> okay, so it has capacity zero, <laughs> all right? So don't worry about, think that there will be Neumann boundary conditions, but you don't, even, you don't even have to prove that because it has zero capacity, okay? So, so think of the PDE for S positive, T positive, and that's it. And we have to prove instability, even Morse index infinity in dimensions two, four, no, four and six, uniqueness and stability in dimension 14 and higher. These are, this is what is known, what is proved in these papers. Uh, myself, the first one is with Joana Terra, who is now in Buenos Aires. So uh, let's just look a little fast to the proofs. Uh, instability in dimension four and six. You differentiate the equation, of course, and you try to get, you try to get, um, you try to get um, a function that uh, makes 
uh, that makes the quadratic form a negative definite. So the right thing, the quadratic, is to differentiate the equation in some direction. And now I need to consider these coordinates, not S and T, but Y and Z. Y is the distance to the vertex, is the distance along the cone, and Z is the orthogonal direction. So you differentiate on the Z direction. Here you see the, lap, the linearized operator. This is what will appear in the quadratic form, and these are the errors. You plug this in the quadratic form, and you have to work with these two guys. And then, to prove instability, you have to go to infinity. It's like a blowdown. You go to infinity to be closer and closer to the cone that we know that it's unstable. You go to infinity, which is this blowdown here. You multiply uz by a test function, which is going to be a power, like always in this business, like in the Bombieri de Giorgi Giusti or in the Simons papers, a power that will contradict or not the hard inequality. There is always at the end a hard inequality when you go to infinity. And depending on the constant in front of, the hard, on, on, of this, on this hard inequality, depending if it's larger or smaller than the true Hardy constant, you get stability or instability. And this constant appears to be larger or smaller in dimension to change this character in dimension seven or eight, okay? So in dimension four and six, you get instability. The constant is larger than the Hardy one, okay? By the way, another way to understand, the, one that, the only intuitive way I also understand why minimizers want to go through the origin is because if you look in polar coordinates or maybe in ST coordinates, in the origin, there is the Jacobian, R to the n minus 1, when you measure area, but also perimeter, say area. Uh, in polar coordinates, R to the n minus 1. In bipolar coordinates here in the Simons cone, S to the power m minus 1, T to the power m minus 1, ds dt, right? That's the energy. When you go through the origin, this function, r to the n minus 1, gets smaller and smaller near the origin as n gets larger, right? As n gets larger, r to the n minus 1 is smaller and smaller near the origin. That's why you pay less energy going through the origin in a very rough, in a very rough way, okay? In a very Good. Uh, another result that I need in the following is the asymptotic behavior at infinity. This is proved by compactness and some beautiful Liouville theorems for the allen kahn equation in all space and in half space. This paper, this, these, are, these, are, this, this, uh, these uh, results are due to Angenen in the half space and then in all space by Berestiki Amel, maybe, Verstikian collabor collaborators. Uh, and then you prove that if you walk along the cone, on the cone, what you see, your solution starts looking, when you go to infinity, it starts looking like the 1D solution put transversally to the cone, placed transversally to the cone, okay? So move on the cone, wherever you are on the cone, the cone is like that. <laughs> it's like that. The cone is like that. Make the normal to the cone, make the normal, and then put the 1D solution there. So this is it. This is the 1D solution, by the way, it's this one, put on the orthogonal direction because, because this is the orthogonal direction to the cone. And you can prove that the saddle shaped solution, when you go to infinity, gets closer and closer to uh, this function, which is not a solution, of course. The uniqueness I proved using a trick that I learned from Berestiki, Nirenberg, and Varadan, a paper by Berestiki, by Berestiki, Nirenberg, and Varadan, previous works also by Berestiki and Nirenberg alone. It's the maximum principle in narrow domains because the trick is this, for those of you who know the maximum principle, 
it's quite nice. But I, did, I was not sure it, you could split like this. So there is a splitting which is funny that works. Look, uh, you take the solution of Allen Kahn and you realize that automatically, where it's positive, on this side of the cone, it's a super solution of the linearized problem. You have a positive super solution of the linearized problem. That implies that the maximum principle is true in bounded domains whenever the positive solution is bounded away from zero. So if you go to the red part, which means a little far away from the cone, then you is going to be larger than a constant, positive constant, and it's very simple to prove that in this blue part, the, the linearized operator is coercive, say, satisfies the maximum principle, because admits a positive super solution, strictly positive, bounded below, super solution. And then what remains is this blue part, which is very narrow. I can make it, can take delta very small. This is going to be epsilon, also very small. It's a very narrow neighborhood of the Simon's cone. And in narrow domains, the maximum principle is always true, say. And these were the ideas of, of Berestigi and, and Nirenberg, mainly. And the funny thing is that I can put both things together and at the end prove that, um, that this fact here, that uh, the linearized operator satisfies the maximum principle on one side of the cone, okay? On one side of the cone. And this gives you right away uniqueness. It's very simple. If there are two saddle shaped solutions, you can prove that there is a smallest one. That's very easy. Then you compare them. You linearize in this rough way. F is concave when F is positive. Um, but voila, it's uh, just one line from the m applying, applying the maximum principle and the asymptotics, okay? So that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's nice. Uh, the saddle shape solution is unique. Now it remains to prove that it's a stable or a minimizer in some dimensions, okay? And finally, to prove, um, I want to show you a little the flavor of the proof of stability in dimension 14, 16, and higher, because I think this is, here there should be some room to do it in dimension 12 or 10 or eight, okay? How it goes, first I need something quite nice, which is on the spirit of qualitative properties of solutions, like in the works of Louis and collaborators. Uh, monotonicity properties. I, it's very important first to prove these monotonicity properties. On this side of the cone, on this side of the cone, U is increasing on the tangential variable to the cone, on this other variable, minus dt, and this is a cone of monotonicity. In all these black uh, directions, U increases. And also, I need a second derivative uh, inequality. How do you prove this? You can imagine. You write an equation for Uy. So here you already see the PDE, my, my, my beloved PDE, that I want to see more people working on this PDE, uh, if you also like it, which is that one. Here it's written in YZ coordinates, and see here you see you differentiated ones already. This is was for instability. And here again, we differentiated. You have differenti to differentiate the S term and the T term the polar coordinates in S and in T. You get extra terms, but they have the right sign. You use the maximum principle asymptotics and infi at infinity, and you prove this sign for these derivatives on one side of the cone. And with this, I can give you, and I finish here, the flavor of my result on stability in R14, R16, and higher. Here is the algebra. The algebra is here. At some point, I will need to take a real number such that this is negative, non-positive, and B is positive. And this is only possible if 2M is larger than 14. And now this is, uh, so I want to prove stability. Again, 
I need to find a positive super solution of the linearized pro problem. Positive super solution of the linearized problem. So I differentiate, the, I, I find the super solution with derivatives of the function. And this is like, this in fact, it's like a derivative of u in a hyperbolic direction like this. It's like a derivative not orthogonal to the plane, that would be uz, but like in a hyperbolas, and, um, and it becomes this. It's very simple because b is positive. Uh, right away, phi is positive because of the monotonicity properties proved. And now one has to check this. Once you have this, this is automatic. Oh, just one line proof. You have to prove this, and this is a computation. You just compute. Compute the equation satisfied by US, linearized equation, the equation satisfied by UT, the Laplace of T minus B, the Laplace of S minus B. All these are equalities. This is an equality. Throw this term, which was very dangerous by, 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 by this monotonicity property, convexity, convexity property, sorry, remain with U, S, U, T, and then just some algebra that is easier in, la in LaTeX than in written. <laughs> some algebra, and at some point, you have to use the algebra that these and these are comparable. Here it's where the 14 comes into place, and at the end, you get to something that has a sign on, on one side of the cone, and that's, uh, and that's what gives you stability. So with this, I finish my, my talk, and I thank you for the, for the attention. So thank you very much. Our questions, comments? And do you know if uh, the saddle solutions uh, are uh, non-degenerate uh, in the sense of the linearized operator? Or very, uh, very good question. <laughs> very tough. <laughs> very tough. Um, <laughs> the saddle shape solution uh, in dimension two, if the paper by Michel Schatzman is correct, that's the point of the paper, to prove that the linearized operator has not zero as eigenvalue, and it has only one negative eigenvalue. Mm -hmm. With, say, some, in some functional space, if you want, or some decay at infinity. And this would tell you that the Morse index is one. And that's what she proves. I didn't check all the papers, so I, I cannot say anything. I just heard from uh, several experts that uh, I think at some point he needs a computer to check something. <laughs> And I'm not sure if that's the only place where they have an objection or maybe another place also. But this you should ask maybe Chan Feng Gay or Alberto Farina, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure now, but, uh, but in higher dimension in R, okay, in R4, in R6, we know that has infinite Morse index mm -hmm. yes, because I proved that with a, uh, with Joanna Terra, whenever you get a Hardy constant which is larger than the, you get a constant which is larger than the Hardy constant, automatically that Schrodinger operator has infinitely many negative eigenvalues. I don't know if it's non-degenerate. Could be, yeah, it could be. I, I don't know of any, and it looks like yeah, that problem, right? Because also your uniqueness result may point to this direction. My unique, uniqueness usually is proved after proving non-degeneracy. You're right. I didn't think about this. My proof doesn't use non-degeneracy because, as I tell you, it's much tougher. But points up, points in that direction. Okay. Thanks, yeah. Yes, thank Probably the, so, the solutions of, of uh, Pakar Way and Kelly Wang now, those are known to be uh, mm. strict minimizers, I mean, non-degenerate, because they are, built, they are built through the implicit function theorem, say. Yes, yes. Thank you.